Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, Blue Marble Riders. I'm often asked what it's like to own three very different bikes. That is a tough, tough question and one that I will answer today. The three bikes I own are very different. I've got a 2014 V-Strom 1000. I've got a 2018 Z900 RS. And I've got this middle child, if you like, the Moto Guzzi Griso 1200 SE. It's a 2016 model. They are very, very different bikes. A lot of people like to compare bikes by what sort of horsepower, torque or top speed it has. Outright performance. Now that isn't always the best way to compare a bike. A bike is more than just a couple of specs. It's more than just the sum of its parts. The first thing we should really talk about is the seating positions and how they are similar and different. This, for instance, has a 7.3 inch ground clearance. That is the highest ground clearance of all my bike. More ground clearance than the V-Strom. And yet, it's only got a 31.5 inch seat height which is the lowest of all my bikes. So that should tell you something right now. This is a very vertically compact bike. You sit in this bike. You don't really sit on it. It's a very wide seat on this bike. The seat is uh, very comfortable, very wide. Uh, it feels like a, a big bike between your legs, but you realize you are very low and that you are very compact. Your legs are up very tight. Okay. My jeans don't usually show the tops of my boots, but my legs are so bent here with the pads doing and the jeans doing the job that they're supposed to do that uh, my legs are, ooh, they're probably at a 60 degree angle. A lot of people get peg lowering kits. I don't want it. This offers me something different from both of my other bikes. The bike also cants you forward. The, the Moto Guzzi cants you forward like this. I'm more counted forward than either of my other bikes, slightly more than the Kawasaki's. And what a different ride it is. The bikes are similar dimensions, but the ride couldn't be any more different. My seating position is uh, more relaxed than on the Guzzi. It's a five and a half inch ground clearance and a 33 inch seat height. Therefore, this thing gives me more vertical area to play with for my body. My legs aren't so bent. I got aftermarket LSL bars, so I'm canted forward more than I would be on the stock one, but not so much as the Guzzi. And then there's this. The 2014 Gen 2 Suzuki V-Strom 1000. This bike, as soon as I get on it, it's like an old friend. It's like sitting in that favorite couch that you've got. This is comfy. I've got a bigger leg angle down here. It's got a ground clearance of 6.5 inches at a height of about 34. So I've got the most clearance between my feet and my buttocks. I'm also in a very upright position. This would not be rideable at speed if it wasn't for the windshield in front of it. But it offers me so much in the way of plush comfort. So this bike I'm canted forward and my legs are relatively high. So that's the first riding position as I'm in the bike. I really feel part of this bike. I get lots of feedback from it because I'm not sitting on top of it, I'm sitting in it. The second thing about this bike is it is the heaviest of my bikes. So being the most diminutive in the sort of vertical realm, it is also the heaviest. So 509 pounds, not an extortionately amount heavier than the V-Strom, but about seven pounds heavier than the V-Strom and uh, considerably heavier than the uh, Kawasaki. You feel that weight to a certain degree, especially if you get off the Kawasaki, you will feel the weight. You ride the two bikes very, very differently. She's got a 61 inch wheelbase and an 89 inch overall length. That's almost identical to the V-Strom. You'd think they handle very much the same. And in some respects they do. Both of them are very good at tracking in straight lines down the highway. Very predictable handling. But the difference is this one is quicker, quicker handling than the V-Strom. The V-Strom of course has a 19 inch wheel on the front. This doesn't, it has a pair of 17 inches, identical dimensions in every way to the Kawasaki Z900 RS. And that translates with some of the handling. So the handling on this bike though is far from plodding. 
It's nimble, linear, precise and responsive. You use your body a lot on this bike to move it round corners. It feels great. Basically just sneak across on a cheek, bend that inside arm and that's all you need to do to get a little bit of counter steer and the bike will groove into corners like she's on rails and she'll go quickly round corners. It is though a different experience from the Kawasaki. This thing is about 57 inches for wheelbase which is much shorter than the Good Sea or the Vistrom and about 83 inches overall again shorter and what that translates to is very sparkling handling it is very agile very sparkling this thing will go round corners you just have to look there and it will go there it's a far far pure sportier ride than either of the other two bikes this bike it does it so easily so quickly and it's so easy to handle it feels lighter than the good seat the bike is very poised very poised poised under duress poised in high speed handling poised at low speed this is the longest bike but only 0.3 of an inch longer than the Gutsy. the wheelbase is about i think they're identical this tracks really well just as the Gutsy does it goes around corners really well not quite as well as the Gutsy because of course the Gutsy is on a 17 inch front its geometry is slightly different but it's a very good handling bike the suspension on this is plush but firm. It's uh, 502 pounds wet, which seems like a lot, but when you compare it with other ADV bikes, it's super light. Doesn't handle like a couch? No, it doesn't. It's very neutral handling. You can break round corners without fear of it dumping its front end or any of that. Again, it's just so different from the other bikes. It is a learning curve though. If you hop from one bike to another, this is perhaps the most technical and interesting bike to learn to ride, to learn to ride well. The V-Strom being very neutral, as we've already mentioned, is very easy. And the Kawasaki is such a forgiving bike, such a sparkling bike, so quick. So how does the bike feel? Well, she feels soulful effortless, nimble and sort of that surge of power. She's a solid bike. You have to sort of get in control of her. It becomes natural after a while. You're, it's just the way you ride her. You ride her with authority. You let her know that uh, you're the boss. But she's not an out of character bike, she's not something that's going to uh, make it very hard for you to ride her. She's an easy bike to ride once you get to know her, but she is very different from the others. And part of that character comes from, well, what you're looking at now. Those big V-twin cylinders sticking out of the side there. It's a longitudinal V-twin of course. Of course the cylinders stick out either side, perpendicular to the uh, direction the bike runs but the crankshaft is longitudinal and that gives it a lot of character you will have heard that if you blip a motor goodsy when you're standing still it will rock from one side to the other well, that's maybe an overstatement it will slightly lilt yes it will but uh, when you're riding you won't feel that you won't feel it won't intrude on the handling at all but the engine definitely gives the bike even more character it's a big pulsing block this one's 1200 cc's and you can feel its presence it's not uncomfortable it's not overly vibey except at idle but producing its 109 horsepower at about 7500 rpm and it's uh, meaty the talkiest of all my bikes 80 foot pounds at about 6400 rpm this thing feels every inch a talky riding bike the hydraulic clutch about average maybe a little heavier than normal the gearbox is a wonderful syncopation when you blast off through the gears on this it's a lovely syncopation a harmonious sort of syncopation it's uh, a very smooth yet you're very clear about that you've just changed gear so let's go on to the engine what have we got 
Well, we've got, uh, as you know, an inline four. That's four cylinders in line, all in one block. The characteristics of that engine typically are that uh, you have to rev them high to make them go. Not this case. This engine, even though I've had it remapped, it's a stock remap, it wasn't meant for high end. Even though I've had it remapped, it does have more urgency high end, but it also puts out the same amount of torque that it did as stock, which is a considerable amount. The torque on this bike is about 72 foot-pounds, about 6,500 RPM, not much different than the Guzzi. And then, of course, there's the horsepower, which is the most of all my bikes. This is about 120, because I've had it uh, mapped, but it came stock around about 115, 111, something like that, at about 8,000 RPM. The engine is buttery. I'm in sixth gear now, pottering along. If I want to be more urgent, I could put it into fourth, okay? And it will really, really take off. And that's the other thing about this bike, the snappy, snappy performance. The bike is very easy to ride at slow or fast speeds. This is just simply an easier bike to ride than either of the other two bikes. It feels lighter, it's incredibly responsive, it's lithe, the handling is sparkling, and it, is, it does require you with the throttle to be very precise. The throttle isn't quite digital. I've had it, uh, when I got this bike, it was a very digital throttle, but I've had it flashed. And so the throttle is easier than it was, but it's still a very quick bike. And if you input power to it and you aren't in control, well then there are no modes on this bike. It does have traction control. So it requires a precise right hand, and again, that's a transition from the Guzzi, which is a more forgiving bike to ride. It's not quite so urgent. They have different qualities, and that's what I love about them. The gearbox on this bike is lithe and fast. It's very snickety. You can rip up through the gears and flick through those gears so rapidly. There's a real sense of syncopation with this bike's gearbox. If I had a quick shift on this bike, I simply wouldn't use it. I wouldn't use it on the Guzzi either. I might use it on the V-Stream, not that the gearbox is bad, but I don't use that bike for the same sort of feedback that I get off these bikes. This, wow, just that immediate grunt from down low comes on tap like that. When I get back on this bike, that I, I appreciate that in a way that even though the other bikes are talky, they don't do that at three to 4,000 RPM not in the same way. It's now this engine is liquid cooled. It's a liquid cooled V-twin, but unlike the Guzzi, it's not a longitudinal crankshaft. It's a transverse crankshaft, which of course delivers its power in a different way. This is also chain drive. It's got no problem getting its power to the chain. So even though it makes the least power of any of my bikes at spot on 100 horsepower, it delivers probably as much as the Guzzi does because it's not being robbed by a shaft drive. The torque comes in about 77 foot-pounds, three foot-pounds less than the Guzzi, but it comes in at 4,000 RPM, not 6,400. And that gives you different qualities. The engine itself is uh, very linear. So it has that torque burble, very, very low down. So from, from nothing till uh, five, five and a half, six is fine. There's absolutely no reason, unless you want the deep throb, to rev it above five and a half or six thousand rpm how would i describe this bike in a few words i would uh if i were to liken it to an aircraft it would be a later mark spitfire powerful fast needing an initial takeoff a firm hand just like the spitfire the the later mark over mark 20s those things need you need to plant the rudder hard when you're going down the runway and opening up the throttle because like this it'll pull to one side slightly but after a while, you're totally used to it. It's like anything. Uh, is it as nimble as the early Mark Spitfires? Not quite, but it's not far off it either. And if I were to liken it to another bike, well, I simply can't. I'm sure there are a lot of bikes out there with character and soul, but I'm not sure there are many with as much character and soul as this, and I mean it in the best possible way, not making excuses for deficiencies because I found none on this bike. The only thing I could liken this bike to is another Moto Guzzi, perhaps a Le Mans or a 1200 Sport, something like that, because uh, I've really never ridden anything like it. And it's that 
which makes this bike so attractive to me when I get off either of my other bikes which are very different from each other it's that which keeps me in love with it well the Goodsea I talked about as being like a late mark Spitfire this bike it's perhaps more f even freer in its handling than the Griso because it's lighter because it's uh, a little more sparkling uh, just like the early Mark Spitfires were said to probably be among the best handling of all the Spitfires ever made. I'd have to say that if this were a plane, that's probably what it would be. An early Mark Spitfire compared with a later Mark Spitfire, which perhaps feels a bit more substantial. When it comes down to handling, this is very, very light and flickable. So I guess I could buy, you know, if I was lucky enough, I could buy a Ducati V4 Street Fighter or Panigale and have one bike that would cost me, you know, I don't know, 35,000. I'm not sure how much they cost, but a lot of money. And yes, probably it would be the ultimate riding machine. More power, more this, more that. But would I get used to it? possibly not used to the incredible power I'd probably never use it I never would be I'm not talented enough to be able to use the performance of a Ducati V4S to its maximum and I think I would find that frustrating I'd find it frustrating that I couldn't wring the neck of that beast and that it was always really just sort of laughing at me saying what are you doing with me you are just tickling my tummy. If I roll over on my front, pounce on you, you're done. Luckily, it's got some AI-inspired electronics to keep it in its cage, because if it wasn't kept in its cage, I'd be in a real pickle. As desirable as that bike is, a wonderful piece of engineering, a gorgeous bike to look at, uh, uh, probably a status symbol to own, something to go out on and, and be looked at. Here I am on a Vistrom, the complete opposite end of the spectrum but I bet you when I get off another bike and I get on this one I'm smiling just as much because it's not what the bike can actually do because I can't possibly as I've said use that Ducati to its maximum it's how the bike makes you feel having three or four bikes as I have I appreciate each and every one of them for different reasons and I appreciate them all the more because when I get off one, like this, and get on the Gutsi, or I get on the Vistro, I fall in love again. For me, variety is the spice of life. And rather than chasing another bike, another bike, another bike, I've got these four bikes, three of which are for the road, and I just love going between them. It's reinvigorated having the Moto Guzzi Griso 1200 SE and the Kawasaki 900 RS has reinvigorated my appreciation of this bike. How strange is that? And isn't that what we're doing when we go out, test ride, try and buy a brand new bike? We're, we're buying the new different experience it gives us. And what if we could can that and do that every single time? with the bikes we already own. That is why I do it. That's why I've got the four different bikes. And isn't it that which made us originally fall in love with the bike when we got on it and we rode it and we thought, this is refreshing, this is different. It's not the best. Is it the best bike on the planet? I'm sure it isn't, but it is so different. And for me, it feels the best when I get on it from getting on one of the others, just like when I get on my Kawasaki feels the best. It's great. I get on that thing and I think, oh, this is why I've got this bike. Wow. And I get on the Gutsi after this and it gives me something this doesn't give me. If I had this as an only bike, would I still treasure it? I would definitely treasure it. Would I treasure it as much? No, because every time I step off one of the other bikes onto one of the other ones, the character of that bike washes over me like I'm riding it for the first time. And you might be riding around and you'll get off this bike and you'll say, that is a beautiful bike. I could, I could never sell it. One of these has got to go. I, I, I want to change up. So you'll just point at the other bike, one of the other bikes, and you'll say, it'll be that one. 
you'll then go out for a ride on that bike some minutes or some hours or some days later and the same thing will happen infuriatingly you'll fall back in love with that bike and when you get home you'll get off it and say that bike it can never go it'll have to be one of the others and so I've got people saying well is there one bike out there that could satisfy all three of those I can hear you now surely there's a bike out there that can do all three I'd have to say I don't think there is a bike out there that could do all three of the things that my Vistrom, my Kawasaki and my Moto Guzzi do. If there was one bike, if I was forced to get rid of all three of these bikes, the only bike that I can see that would in a very dilute way perhaps emulate each of these bikes to a certain degree would probably be I can't tell you I can't tell you because it truly would not replace the Kawasaki Z900 RS it wouldn't replace the V-Strom and despite it being of the same manufacturer as the Griso it would not replace my beloved Griso either but you never know one day I suppose things can change. Whoa, that dog, all the time. Once again, thanks for watching everyone. If this is the first time you've watched, please consider subscribing. I do product reviews, motorcycle reviews, off-road and...